In the year 1675, in Bedford, England, the famous Puritan preacher and writer John Bunyan was arrested for preaching publicly without a license. He was jailed for six months. Previously, he'd spent 12 years in prison, during which time he'd written many books and pamphlets. So rather than seeing this new imprisonment as a great tragedy, he took an optimistic view of it. He is reported to have said, I've been away from my writing too long. Maybe this is not so much a prison as an office from which I can reach the world with Christ's message. Whether or not these were Bunyan's precise words, his ministry during this short imprisonment is undeniable. It was during these months that he wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, an allegory of the Christian life that had worldwide impact and continues to influence people for Christ even today. Now, we should all admire someone who accomplishes so much for Christ while in prison. But as significant as John Bunyan's work has proven to be, the Apostle Paul's work accomplished something much greater. During his four years of imprisonment in Caesarea and Rome, he wrote epistles that are far more important than Bunyan's book. Near the end of Paul's third missionary journey, probably around the year A.D. 56 or 57, Paul and his traveling companions were making their way from Asia Minor to Jerusalem, primarily by boat. Their intention was to deliver funds they had collected to the poor Christians in Jerusalem who were enduring a famine. On their way, they stopped in Miletus, where Paul met with the elders from the nearby church of Ephesus. During this meeting, Paul revealed that the Holy Spirit had warned him that he would be imprisoned when he arrived in Jerusalem. We read his prophetic words in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 24. I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. In several of the cities Paul had visited, believers prophesied Paul's coming imprisonment, but the Holy Spirit compelled Paul toward this imprisonment. So, Paul knew that these prophecies were not intended to dissuade him from his course, but rather to prepare him for his coming hardships. Paul had many enemies in Jerusalem, and he knew he might be arrested and imprisoned when he arrived. But he also knew that this suffering was part of God's plan for him. During his stay in Caesarea Maritima, Paul was warned yet again not to go to Jerusalem. In a well-known dramatic scene, the prophet Agabus bound his own hands and feet as a prophetic sign, warning that Paul would be arrested and bound if he continued to Jerusalem. It's easy to understand why Paul's friends didn't want him to be arrested. They feared for Paul's safety and didn't want him to come to harm. But Paul knew that God was planning to use his arrest and imprisonment to further the spread of the gospel. When Paul arrived in Jerusalem, he stayed with a believer named Nason and was well received by the church. The next day, Paul visited James, the brother of Jesus, and the author of the New Testament book of James. The elders of the church in Jerusalem also gathered to meet Paul. Presumably, it was at this point that Paul delivered to the church the famine relief funds that he had collected during his third missionary journey. Instead of rejoicing in the generosity of the Gentile Christians and affirming Paul's ministry, James and the elders informed Paul that certain rumors had reached Jerusalem concerning Paul's teachings and practices. Specifically, it was rumored that Paul taught Jewish Christians living among Gentiles to disregard traditional Jewish practices such as circumcision. Now, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem strongly believed that all Jewish Christians should maintain traditional Jewish practices. And James and the elders were concerned 
that the local Jewish Christians would oppose Paul because of these rumors. We should point out that these rumors about Paul were false. Throughout his epistles, Paul affirmed the validity of the moral law of God found in the Old Testament. And beyond this, he did not encourage Jewish communities to abandon the traditions they had added to the Mosaic law. On the contrary, he himself followed Jewish traditions when he was in Jewish communities. However, he did teach that with the death and resurrection of Christ, a new age had dawned. And as he explained in his epistles, neither Gentiles nor Jews were required to maintain these traditions. Listen to the way Paul described his position on these matters in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. Paul was happy to follow Jewish traditions for the sake of the gospel, and he did not hesitate to behave like a Gentile when he was among Gentiles. He was free to abandon these traditional practices, but he was not free from the law's moral requirements in Christ. In short, Paul believed that the applications of God's law had changed now that Christ had come, but that it was still acceptable to maintain Jewish traditions for the sake of the gospel. It's not hard to imagine how such a carefully nuanced doctrine might have been misunderstood, or why it might have been rumored that Paul taught Jews to abandon their traditions. In any event, James and the elders came up with a solution that they believed would satisfy the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. They suggested that Paul demonstrate his commitment to the Mosaic Law by participating in the rituals of the temple in Jerusalem. In particular, they urged him to undergo purification rites with four men who had taken Nazarite vows. Near the end of Paul's week of purification, he was spending time in the inner court of the temple. The temple grounds included both an outer court and an inner court. The outer court was separated from the inner court by a gate. The outer court was called the Court of the Gentiles because people from all nations were permitted to enter it. But the inner court, the court of Israel, was reserved for Jews alone. Gentiles who entered the court of Israel were liable unto death. While Paul was in the court of Israel, he was recognized by some Jews from Asia Minor. These were very likely unbelieving Jews rather than followers of Christ. Earlier, these same Jews had seen Paul with a man named Trophimus, who had accompanied Paul to Jerusalem. Trophimus was also from Asia Minor, and the Asian Jews knew that he was a Gentile. So when they saw Paul in the court of Israel, they wrongly assumed that Trophimus had also entered that court, and they were outraged. In response, these Jews roused the city against Paul, and an angry mob dragged him from the court of Israel, intent on killing him. But when the commander of the Roman garrison in Jerusalem heard that the city was rioting, he rushed to quell the disturbance, chained Paul, and took him into custody. When the Jewish accusers arrived, Felix held a hearing. At this hearing, Tertullus argued that Paul disturbed the peace and incited riots. This was a very serious charge in the eyes of Governor Felix, since it was his duty to keep peace in Judea. But even more importantly, from the Jewish point of view, they also accused Paul of trying to violate the sanctity of the temple. Now, Paul was not a lawyer, but his response to his accusers was compelling. His defense had four main points. First, he pointed out that there were no witnesses against him for any of the alleged crimes. This meant that there was no basis for any of the charges against him. This was an important point because Paul was accused of committing his crimes in broad daylight in a crowded area. If he had been guilty, certainly someone should have seen it. Second, 
he rightly argued that others had disturbed the peace, not he. The riot had been started by Jews from Asia Minor. Paul was not a disturber of the Roman peace. The Jews from Asia Minor were. This fact was confirmed by the letter from Lysias that accused the Jews of planning to assassinate Paul. Third, and perhaps to the surprise of his accusers, Paul insisted that he had no desire to defile the temple. On the contrary, he believed everything written in the scriptures, and he had come to the temple to worship. Fourth, Paul reminded Governor Felix that the Sanhedrin had not found him guilty. This argument was quite damaging to the prosecution. The proper Jewish ruling body, the Sanhedrin, had not proven him guilty of the alleged crimes. Why then did they seek to have him executed? Now, in God's mysterious providence, Felix was a dishonest ruler. Based on the insufficient accusations against Paul, Felix could have released him, but he didn't. Instead, he saw an opportunity for personal gain. So, he held off ruling on the case, preferring to wait for Paul to offer him a bribe. Initially, Felix said he would rule on Paul's case when Lysias, the Roman commander, arrived in Caesarea. But Felix put off ruling on Paul's case for two years. At the end of these two years, however, Felix was replaced as governor by Portius Festus. When Festus took his seat as governor in AD 59, Paul's Jewish opponents in Jerusalem saw another opportunity to kill Paul. They planned another ambush and petitioned Festus to deliver Paul to Jerusalem under the pretense that they wished to have his case reopened and handled locally. So Festus convened a hearing in which he asked Paul if he would be willing to have his case heard in Jerusalem rather than in Caesarea. At this point, rather than agreeing to have his case heard in Jerusalem, Paul appealed to his right as a Roman citizen to have his case heard by Nero Caesar himself. Festus had no choice but to grant this request. Scripture does not record Paul's specific motivation for this appeal, but we do know a few details that might explain it. Most importantly, when Paul had been arrested by Lysias, the Lord himself appeared to Paul in a vision, assuring him that he would live to proclaim the gospel in Rome. As we read in Acts chapter 23, verse 11, The Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Paul's vision at the time of his arrest gave him reason to think that his imprisonment would eventually give him opportunity to proclaim Christ in Rome. As we've seen, the Holy Spirit had already led Paul to believe that his imprisonment would further his gospel ministry. And at this point, he learned that his imprisonment would open the door for him to go to Rome. Now we have to keep in mind that at this time, the power of Rome was, in the eyes of faithful Jews, the most powerful expression of satanic and demonic power in the world. And later in the book of Revelation, the apostle John referred to Rome as the great satanic force that persecuted followers of Christ. To preach in Rome was a magnificent display of God's kingdom purposes. Paul's arrest in Jerusalem had been unjust, painful, and even life-threatening. And his imprisonment at Caesarea had been one long miscarriage of justice. His journey to Rome involved many hardships as well. But in the end, Paul's hopes were realized and God's purposes were fulfilled. Paul made it to Rome and for two years, he was able to preach about the kingdom of God, the greatest threat against the power of the Roman Empire. In Rome, he taught about the Lord Jesus Christ, the King. And he did this with all boldness and without hindrance, despite his house arrest in the capital city of the most powerful evil empire of his day. Paul's journey to Rome is very touching because it's, it's unique how God causes the journey of a man to fulfill a greater purpose that's beyond his imagination. 
If you can imagine Paul having to preach in the synagogues and on the streets, and he's only able to speak to a certain class of people, all of a sudden through the journey of God, the work of God in his life, he's then moved into what you may call confinement. But that confinement allows him to now speak to soldiers, Roman soldiers to be specific. On one of the nights he was to be transported, 200 foot soldiers, 200 spearmen and 70 horsemen had to lead him by night. Guess what they're talking about? Paul, the gospel. And now he's having to stand before governors and men, officials that never came to the synagogue, that were never on the streets. His journey to Rome fulfilled a greater purpose in God's plan to get the gospel to everybody.